All right, so I am Rachel Olson and I am the first year communication and social sciences librarian for the UNCG libraries. Um, UNCG libraries came up with the idea to create a series of webinars for the UNCG community um, on research and applications and this is one of those webinars so welcome. Um, in this series, different librarians cover topics on UNCG libraries resources and research tools. These are 30 minute webinars that are recorded in zoom meetings, which is where we are now. Um, and we're they are placed on the library webpage through YouTube, um, where they will be closed captioned. So I'm going to drop a link in the chat to the page where you can find these webinars later on. Um, this page will also contain other um, applicable links and presentation materials. So I'm going to cover some logistical things about this, how this webinar is going to run. You are set to be muted on entry um, and um, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions um, at the end of the webinar or if you have questions during the actual um, the actual webinar. Since we are a small group, you can feel free to just unmute yourself and ask. Um, let's see, you can also put questions in the chat. Um, and the recording does eventually go on YouTube, so please keep your camera off if you don't want to be featured in the recording. Um, if there are technical issues, I will definitely try to do my best to help you, but worst case scenario, just remember that the session is being recorded. Um, <clears throat> does anybody have any questions before I get started? Okay, so I am going to share my screen. And I will be sharing these slides with you um, at the end of the presentation and you will also get them, um, you'll get the recording of the webinar in an email. So give me just one second to pull up my chat box on my second monitor. Can everybody see these slides? It should say introduction to legal research. Great, perfect. <clears throat> All right, so welcome, thank you for coming. Um, so I am Rachel Olson. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am the first year communication and social sciences librarian here at UNCG. I work with a variety of subjects um, and I uh, also provide support related to legal research, which is sort of why I'm hosting this webinar today. A couple important disclaimers. These are very important. I am not an attorney. I am not a law librarian. I do not have a legal degree and nothing that I'm about to tell you is legal advice and it should not be taken that way. Um, I also want to give a huge thank you to Jason Sowards. Um, he was the instructor of a course that I took called uh, Legal Materials for Information Professionals this time last year and I learned a great deal from him. Um, and I also want to just say, I am not an expert in legal information, so this will be a very general overview. Okay, this is a very broad overview of some federal legal information. It is in no way exhaustive. I was reviewing some things yesterday and I, just because of time, um, you know, we're skipping a great deal. So if you have questions, if there are things that we don't talk about that you would like to cover, please ask. And if I don't know the answer, I will certainly track it down for you. So what we're gonna cover um, <laughs> in the next 20-ish minutes or so, the basics of legal information, some major sources of legal information, just a few, um, some things that are specific to UNCG, like databases that you can use to find legal information, and a little bit on citing legal documents. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on American federal law today. Um, state law is kind of a whole other animal. Um, and I would be happy to you know, talk to you about state law and state legal information, um, but for our purposes, I figured federal might be just a little bit more um, of broader interest. So what is legal information? So legal information, when I say that, I mean documents written about the law, published along with the law, the actual legal documents themselves, things like that. So this, this can mean a wide variety of things. Legal information isn't just um, the text of the law. Um, and we're going to look at it in kind of a, um, um, I'm trying to I'm sorry, I'm trying to adjust my window here. We're gonna look at it from sort of a variety of different angles today. So legal information is a very broad term. So three branches of the US government and the law, and this is kind of how I'm gonna frame this for you today. So we have the legislative branch and at the federal level that is Congress, um, the Senate and the House of Representatives, right? Where they are responsible for writing the laws. Laws 
are also called statutes. Okay, so in a lot of times you'll see um, in the text things referred to as statutes, that means laws. Um, at the state level, it really differs. Um, every state, I believe every state's legislation, legislature has uh, two chambers, so bicameral, um, except for like Nebraska or something. Anyway, in North Carolina, it is the General Assembly. Um, that is our legislative body. So the legislature writes the laws. The executive branch is responsible for enforcing the laws. Now at the federal level, um, the executive branch does this in a variety of different ways, but when an issue is particularly complicated or nuanced um, or you know, would require a lot of oversight, they'll actually create agencies to do this work and they empower the agencies um, to do what they need to do and agencies write their own rules or regulations. So we're gonna look at some of that. So legislative writes the laws, executive enforces the laws through a variety of means. And then the judicial branch is responsible for interpreting the law. Um, and this usually comes in the form of court opinions. Um, and for this session, we are mostly going to focus on the Supreme Court of the United States. But we will talk a little bit about how um, the court system in the United States is organized. Any questions so far? Feel free to ask in the chat, unmute, whatever works for you. Three branches of government. So. Let's start by talking about congressional information. We're talking about legislative information here. Um, this is the process of creating laws. Um, we will talk about what happens after laws are published, but I'm actually going to take you to congress.gov. And hopefully you can see this. Um, just let me know. It's not still on my slides, right? Like it went to Congress. Perfect. Okay. Great. So this is congress.gov. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, and there are a variety of different things that you can do on congress.gov. I think it's actually kind of a helpful website. Um, so when I teach this to political science classes, one of the first things I like to point out is their main search bar. Um, <laughs> right now it's on current Congress and we are in the 117th session of Congress right now. Um, so if you were looking for things that are relevant to what's happening right now in Congress, that is just fine. You could leave it there and search. If you are interested in something that happened previously in a past Congress, you would want to change this to all Congresses, which is what I'm going to do here. Um, so what I'm gonna look up uh, just as a sample search, let's try, oh, I don't know, food allergy. I'm looking for um, congressional information related to food allergies, potential laws maybe that have been created. Okay, so this is actually something that looks pretty new, the Food Allergy Safety Treatment Education and Research Act of 2021. Um, and the congressional record um, is sort of like a daily thing that comes out that basically is the text of what happened in Congress that day. Um, but I'm actually more interested at this moment um, at looking at bills. So the FASTER Act of 2021, FASTER stands for Food Allergy Safety Treatment Education and Research. Um, I'm going to click on the bill and you can see it appears to have been um, introduced both in the Senate and in the House, and you can tell um, here, Senate is S, um, HR is uh, House of Representatives. Um, so I'm gonna click on the Senate version. So it looks like it was introduced on March 3rd, um, and it has been passed in both the Senate and the House and has gone to the president. This is one of my favorite features of congress.gov is this tracker. It tells you where things are sort of in the process of becoming a law. Um, so another kind of neat feature is a very basic like summary of what the law means. Um, you could also look at the text of the actual law. If you click text, and this is what it says. Okay, so you could specifically go through it. Um, you could look at, sometimes they're gonna reference, so right here they're referencing the United States Code, which we will talk about um, to potentially, it looks like this is um, defining things or clarifying things that are already in um, the US Code. So that's interesting. Um, you can see the text of it. You could download it if you wanted to, actions. If you go to actions, you can actually see um, sort of the different phases that this law has gone through. My computer's being just a little bit slow here. 
So you can see where kind of where it went, um, how the process worked, what date, if you're interested in that, titles, different um, ways that this has been referred to. Okay, so short titles, um, the formal title, things like that. Um, another interesting piece before we move on is co-sponsors. So if you were interested in who sponsored this legislation, which member of Congress actually brought this to um, brought this to the floor. Interestingly enough, it looks like Tom Tillis of North Carolina was a co-sponsor of this bill. Um, this does look bipartisan. You can see next to their name, um, the D or the R, in some cases I would stand for Democrat, Republican, Independent, and you can see the state that they come from. Um, this is an important moment to tell you that if you are interested in a particular member of Congress, you could click on their name and it would actually take you to a page. This is for Tom Tillis. Senator from North Carolina gives you contact information. What I find really interesting is this, if you scroll down, it is a record of all the legislation that Tom Tillis has ever sponsored or co-sponsored as a member of Congress. Um, and that is pretty interesting to me. And you could look through different sessions of Congress. He appears to have been a Senator since 2015. Um, you could look at types of bills policy areas if you were interested in that. So if you want a record of Tom Tillis's sponsorship or co-sponsorship, that's where you would find it. That is an incredibly quick overview of congress.gov. Are there any questions about congress.gov? I'm happy to take those. That's just a, a fraction of what you can do with this website, but it's what I find most interesting. So what happens when a bill becomes a law? Great question. Um, so when a bill becomes a law in Congress, okay, after the president signs it, um, it goes into what are called slip laws. And slip laws are basically just like the text of what the law literally says when it was passed. It goes into um, these bound volumes. It's really not that helpful. Um, they're published really quickly for public use. Um, when a particular session of Congress ends, um, when the session is over, all the statutes, the laws from that session get put into um, these chronological volumes that are called statutes at large. Um, and statutes at large, we won't spend a lot of time on. They're again, they're organized chronologically. Um, you can find them through a number of places. I prefer to look at this um, Library of Congress site and we have them um, all the way back from 1789 available digitally. However, uh, if you go down, the most recent one that's been digitized only goes up, I think they only go up to about 2013 digitally. The process to digitize these is quite slow. Um, so while it is true that these documents are publicly available, the process of making them publicly available online takes some time. So anyway, um, the reason I'm not spending much time on the statutes at large is because what I'm most interested in talking to you about is the US code. Um, and the US code is, you can think of it, um, it's basically like a thematic organization of, of statutes um, related to the United States. And if you're interested, by the way, in how current is this, because as laws change and get enacted, the code gets updated, things like that. So how current is this is over on the right here. And it will tell us current through November of 2020 which is pretty good. This comes from the Cornell um, Legal Information Institute, which is one of my favorite resources for finding legal information online. Um, and there are 54 sections of the US code um, and you can see them all here. Um, and so what I like about it is that it is thematic in its organization rather than chronological. It doesn't rely on us knowing the specific name of a law or the specific date when a law was um, enacted. So. Let's say that we're interested in this food allergies topic. Um, I would probably find that, you can see this table of contents, just looking quickly, food and drugs is title 21 of the US code. So maybe I would find something there, okay? Um, and you could look through this different, um, these different kind of section or chapters of particular um, sections of the code. Um, give me just one second. Let's see, I think it's probably, I was looking when we were looking at that other act on um, congress.gov, I believe I saw something about 
the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. So I'm just gonna peek here and see what I can find. And you can see, so we went into the US code and then we went into what's called a title. So title 21, from title 21, we chose chapter nine. Now we're in chapter nine and we're gonna have to choose a sub chapter. So it's organized, you kind of go down that way. And when we talk about citing these, um, I'm gonna show you a nice example that tells you kind of where things go. Um, so if I were interested in, let's just do food. Sub chapter four, and then you could look at, I'm just sort of playing around at this point, food additives. And here's what the US code has to say about food additives. Um, and you'll notice this is kind of a longer one, but not all these sections are very long. Some of them are only a paragraph or two in terms of what they actually have to say about this. And you will notice lots of different um, links to things. So if we were to click on where it says food additive here, <clears throat> it's going to actually define it for us, which I think is kind of nice. Um, so if you didn't know what a particular term meant, you could do that. You can also sometimes see got here another definition um, because it's referring to the secretary um, which secretary there are lots of secretaries right so if we click on it it clarifies they mean the secretary of health and human services here you will also in the code sometimes see references to um, other policies other sections of the code or specific legal cases i'm looking for that yeah down here this is called a i believe it's called a statutory history um, if i'm not mistaken and this tells you the original date when this was added to the US code and kind of all the revisions that have been made since then. So it looks like the last revision in this version of the code was made in 2018. And you could actually click on it and see what that specific, um, what that specific statute said. And of course I'm getting an error. we could then look up what it has to say. This isn't a great example, but anyway, the Cornell Legal Information Institute is one of my favorite resources. Um, they have a couple of other things in here that we're, for each concept that I'm gonna to try to explain, um, I've chosen my favorite resource. Please know this is not the only place where you can find the US code. Um, it's in several places on the internet. This is just sort of my favorite, okay? Um, so when the law, becomes a law, um, it goes into the slip laws, then it goes into statutes at large, then if uh, some laws become codified and go into the US code, um, if they kind of fit, okay? Questions about that? I said that we talk about how to cite the US code. This is a nice example from um, the Georgetown Law Research Guide. So this tells you which title of the US code something came from, there are 54 of them. Um, this USC tells you that it came from the US code. Um, and then this tells you the particular section that you're looking at, and then the edition of the US code that you were using. Um, this is important because when we're thinking about um, in, and I hope I'm explaining this right. When we're looking at certain cases, you might use a different edition of the code because let's say I'm suing you for something that you did in 2014. I need to use the 2014 edition of the code to find out whether or not what you did was illegal at the time, um, if that makes any sense. Um, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting that, but that is my understanding of why you might use different editions of the US code, okay? Very brief overview again. <clears throat> so moving on to the executive branch, as I said before, um, when the federal government needs something done um, or we need to create a new service or something like that, they'll often create agencies. If it is something that's particularly nuanced or is gonna need a lot of attention and detail, they will create an agency, which they will then empower to enforce the law that they've created. Um, these are just some examples. There are dozens of federal agencies, the FDA, NASA, EPA, Social Security. You can see just a couple different examples here. These are some of the bigger ones um, or some of the most ones that came to my mind at least. So these agencies are empowered to enforce the law. Um, now, where do <coughs> the agency laws go? By the way, agency laws are regulations. So when we say regulations, we're talking about rules that have been created by these federal agencies to enforce the law. 
Um, you can find them in several places. My favorite is the Code of Federal Regulations. You can think of it sort of like the US Code. Um, it is sort of organized thematically as well. It's called the CFR. Um, this is not the only place where you can find the CFR online. Again, it's just one that I prefer. Again, organized thematically, it is telling me how current this information is. This is current as of two days ago. So this is actually even more up to date than the US code, okay? Um, at least the US code that we were looking at. <laughs> I don't know how many titles, there are 50 titles in the Code of Federal Regulations. Again, organized thematically. So I'm just gonna choose one Let's look at wildlife and fisheries, title 50, and then press go. And you can see here, um, again, organized into, um, within the title, you have a volume of the title, you have a chapter and you have a part of a chapter. So the structure is just a little bit different, but it is kind of organized in that, like the same sort of breakdown. Um, so uh, they also have kind of a nice explanation here of what's in each part. So if I were interested in fishery conservation and management, or if I was interested in uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, this tells me that's where you're gonna find it in this particular chapter. I could click on it and then it breaks it down even further from there. Um, I'm gonna see if I can find something on NOAA specifically. My dog's making a lot of noise, I'm sorry. Um, Let's just click one, shellfish fisheries of the exclusive economic zone off Alaska. See what it has to say. So you could look at different parts of this. It does have it kind of nicely broken down for you, um, although it does feel like sort of an endless line of clicks one after another. Um, but with a little bit of digging, with a little bit of practice, you can definitely um, find what you're looking for. So these are the regulations related to crab harvesting cooperatives. I didn't know that was a thing but hey, that's great. Um, so again, electronic code of federal regulations. Um, they do have some user information. I honestly haven't played around with this much. You can click on this agency list. Um, so if you knew um, the name of the agency that is in charge of the particular thing you're interested in, it, this is kind of a guide to quickly tell you where you would find that, like what title, um, and what chapter you would find that information. So if I'm interested in the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, you could go to E, find the name, Environmental Protection Agency. It looks like it's in a couple of different places, um, but I'm gonna start with um, Title II. Yeah, and this is just a very broad, Title II appears to be a very broad overview of like these federal agency regulations. So it's gonna be in here somewhere. Environmental Protection Agency. And then we could look at the breakdown from there. I don't wanna belabor this because we don't actually have too much time left, but are there questions about the Code of Federal Regulations? Again, an incredibly short and broad overview of it. Um, citing the Code of Federal Regulations. Again, this comes from the Legal Information Institute at Cornell. Um, it gives you some examples of how to cite it. And we'll talk about citation in just a little bit more. Um, in a few minutes. Okay. Court opinions. So moving to the judicial branch. Um, and just a very quick overview of how the court system in the United States is structured. Um, so it depends on the type of um, case that we're talking about as to where it goes, whether it goes to state court over here on the right or federal court on the left. Um, most things start in state trial courts. Actually, most cases settle before they ever get to court. But if something does go to court, most of the time it starts in a state trial court. It really and truly depends on what happened and where it happened. Um, so at the state level, you would start in trial court. You could go to appeals court. From there, you could go to the highest state court in North Carolina. I believe it's called the Superior Court. Don't quote me on that. Um, and then from there, it could could go to the Supreme Court. I was watching this the video where this uh, infographic actually came out of, and they said that something like 8,000 cases a year get proposed to the Supreme Court, and they only end up 
taking 80 or so of them. So uh, just because you want to take something to the Supreme Court doesn't mean you can, or that they'll hear it because they don't have to. At the federal level, you start in district court and then you can eventually move up to court of appeal, depending again on the ruling, depending what happens. There are all kinds of procedures here. To clarify, courts of appeal are also called circuit courts. So I highly recommend if you're interested in this, um, there's a series called Crash Court Crash Course Government and Politics on YouTube and it is really excellent. Um, and I would highly recommend watching that. So if you're looking for specific case law materials, Google Scholar is one of the best resources I can recommend to you. Um, for best results, I would suggest going through our Google Scholar access here at UNCG. And that is because um, you're gonna get more information available to you than you would if you just went to the public Google Scholar. Okay. Um, so how am I going to get there from library.uncg.edu, which I'm linking right here in the chat. I'm going to click on databases in this red box. And from there, there's a couple different things you could do. Um, if you know the name of the database you want, you can just find it alphabetically. I actually have though a page on law. So if you click on all subjects and scroll down to law, it's going to show you um, a list of databases that we have related to legal information. Um, and Google Scholar is actually not on there, so I need to add that. So anyway, we'll go back to our general page and just find it alphabetically. G. and scroll down to Google Scholar. Again, going through UNCG, um, our access is gonna give you more information than you would if you just went through like the normal public. So when you are on Google Scholar looking for case law, it's right here, this little radio button that says case law, be sure you click that. Um, depending on what you're interested in, federal courts or it defaults to North Carolina courts because it knows I'm in North Carolina, you could click select courts and it'll give you um, a full list of all the different courts that it has information for. Um, there are 13 circuit courts at the federal level, so you could select specific circuits. Um, North Carolina is in the fourth circuit. That doesn't really matter because right now we're just going to focus on the general search um, feature. But anyway, you could click case law. I'm going to try federal court and I want to see what the federal courts have to say about food allergies. We were looking at this earlier. So I just searched the term food allergy and I did that in quotation marks because I wanted to search those two terms together. It's called phrase searching. Um, I wanted to search food allergy as a phrase, not the word food separate from the word allergy. Um, this one, this first case that comes up, let me scroll in a little, or zoom in just a little bit for you. Um, this first case, Land versus Baptist Medical Center, um, this is a, a case from the Eighth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals, and what happened in this particular case was a woman's daughter, I think she was three at the time, had an adverse reaction to peanuts, um, and so her daycare center tried to deny her daycare services on the basis of her daughter's allergy. I can't remember exactly, um, yeah, after she had a second reaction. Um, they refused to provide daycare services anymore. The mother sued, um, saying that this, this uh, qualified under the Americans with Disabilities Act um, as a condition. And I think that they did rule in the mother's favor. I cannot remember right offhand. But you can see when the case happened, this is the text of the opinion. Um, very often they're going to cite other cases. And if you click on it, uh, it will take you to those other cases, which you could then read the opinions for, um, paying attention to which circuit it comes out of, things like that. Um, you could also, if you wanted a citation for this particular article or this particular case, you could click on this little quotation mark here, cite, and it's going to give you what's called a blue book citation. We haven't talked about the blue book yet, but we will next. Um, and this is a great starting point for you to um, look at legal citations. So if you were 
if you needed some help getting started with citing this particular case, that site tool is a great place to start. What I say about citations with all students, not just legal information, is that any citation creator that you're going to use online uses an algorithm, and those algorithms don't always get it right. So please um, take the citation, feel free to use it, but then check it against something more official, like take the time to go through and, and actually spot check the citation because um, it could be incorrect. Okay. Um, you can see other cases here. It sorts based on relevance by default, um, and I am interested in <laughs> sort of the most relevant ones. And that could that could be a couple things. Relevance could be how often it's cited, um, how often people who search for this term clicked on it. It could be how often the term food allergy is used. A couple different things go into this. Right now, it's searching federal courts. If I were interested in North Carolina specifically. I could see there are six in the state of North Carolina um, that deal with food allergy or where food allergy is specifically mentioned. Okay. Um, you can also, if I go back to federal, there are 211 results here. You could either sort by relevance or sort by date. Up to you. Okay. So this shows me uh, kind of the most recent stuff. You could also do custom date ranges if you knew that you were looking for things between 2000 and 2010 or something, you could put that in. Um, I, I don't normally recommend Google Scholar when people are looking for like journal articles and things like that, but for case law, it's actually a really valuable tool. So Google Scholar, in my opinion, is, is one of the best bets. There's also two others, which I've got in my notes down here. Um, Juicia.com and the Harvard Case Law Project um, are also fabulous resources for looking up particular case law. We just have a, another minute or two left, so I want to make sure we get to everything. Um, thinking about legal resources. So we've talked about a lot of these, used a lot of these today. Um, I also wanted to point out these two in particular, these two law library resources. Again, I'm not a law librarian. So when I need to find information um, related to legal research, UNC has a fabulous law library and I will often go to their research guides which are publicly available. The one thing I do want to say about using these guides, um, because we're at UNCG, our access to resources may differ. So you may find something on this guide that's behind a paywall that only UNC students have access to. At that point, you could email me and say, hey, can you help me find access to this particular resource? Um, but I find their subject area guides to be particularly interesting. So if you were interested in intellectual property law, you could click on it. They have an entire guide on intellectual property law and doing research on that. Um, so I highly recommend using these. Again, if you um, come across one and you want access to it and we don't have access, just let me know. Um, same is true of the Georgetown uh, guides. I find them to be really helpful. Um, you could look at, you know, they have resources on taking the bar exam. They have specific guides by state. So this is North Carolina, okay? Um, and you could potentially look at some of this, okay? So I highly recommend those guides. Our legal research guide, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, as the person who maintains it, I feel like I can say this. It, um, it's, it's constantly in progress. It's constantly something that I'm working on. Um, this is what it looks like. And again, I'm going to give you the link to these slides in a minute. So you'll you'll be able to come back and explore this. Um, but I really, you know, I tend to prefer to just kind of link to what the experts have put together. Um, because I think, you know, there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. But I do want to point out um, on our databases page, and you'll also find this on the law resources page, there is a database <clears throat> called Hein Online that I want to be sure to show you before we go. I can't believe I don't have it on here. Wow, I really need to fix this guide. Um, Hein Online. Give me just one second to find it. We'll just go and use the um, A to Z list like we did before. That might be the easiest thing. So as you can see, I have some work to do on the law guide. 
Um, but anyway, library.uncg.edu databases. The name of it is right here, by the way. Again, you'll have the link to these slides. H, it's called Hein Online. If you click on it, this is my top recommendation for legal information um, at UNCG, like a specific database that we subscribe to. Um, what I like it for is those kind of like non, kind of, kind of the unique stuff. So like legal journals, um, they have a fabulous legal journals collection. So if you were looking for um, articles that come from like legal reviews and things like that, this is a really good resource. <clears throat> and for some reason, it's not wanting to pull up. So let me cover something else and we'll, we'll come back and see if that tab decides to cooperate. By the way, Hein Online has lots and lots of um, library guides and tutorial videos and things like that. So I'll put the name of it um, in the chat. I definitely encourage you to check it out. I don't know why it's not wanting to cooperate now. I had it pulled up earlier. Anyway, they have some very interesting collections. I was looking at one this morning, which is the um, uh, the congressional hearings that happened after the JFK assassination and kind of the transcripts of those. It's really interesting stuff. They have thousands and thousands of documents. Highly recommend it. I could do a whole hour on Hein Online. Um, blue book citations. So you might have noticed earlier when we were on Google Scholar, um, I pulled up the citation and it said blue book and then gave me the citation. The blue book is like the kind of the standard of legal citation in the United States. It is published by a group of different law review associations in the United States. Um, you can find them, the Wikipedia page for Blue Book tells you all about it. Um, we don't have online access to the Blue Book, um, but we do have the print manual. It's available at the reference desk in Jackson Library. I can also help you um, figure out, it really depends on the style of citation that you're using as to how you will cite specific legal resources. Um, but I did want to mention the Blue Book and the image says 18th, the most current edition is actually the 21st edition of the Blue Book. This is not something that you would use very often unless you are a, you know, unless you're a law student, but um, it is definitely worth mentioning because Google Scholar says Blue Book and I wanted to explain what that means. So let me just see if Hein Online decided to pull up. It did not. Um, are there any questions? Again, I highly encourage you to explore Hein Online. Um, it's a really good resource. And I could, I will add a slide here um, that talks about um, where you can go to get more information about Hein Online, including their training videos and guides. So I'll put that in. And let me, before I forget, I'm gonna share the link to these slides. Um, if you are watching the recording of this later, uh, don't worry, I will make sure that the link is available to you as well. So these slides. So are there any questions? Feel free to unmute or put it in the chat if there are. I know that was a ton of information. And again, that's a very general overview. Um, we could do a whole nother hour on state law. We could do a whole hour on the Supreme Court. Um, maybe we will in the future if that's of interest to people. No, no questions really, Rachel. I, well, maybe it is a question. Sure. <laughs> you talked about just the limitations if we use um, law, I believe at UNC, you know, at Chapel Hills Library. Mm -hmm. Is that because we are, I guess, not in law school or affiliated with that university in some way or Mm -hmm. So the way it works is that individual wow. libraries have individual subscriptions to these databases. So there's one okay. called Westlaw, which is considered kind of the, the gold standard of, right. um, of law information. Um, that is a very expensive subscription that really only places that have law schools typically have access to or bother to subscribe to because it is so expensive. Um, so the reason that we can't necessarily get everything that UNC has is because our library system, while we do cooperate with them on a lot of things and we're part of, you know, consortiums with them, that's not something that we are able to collaborate with them on. But I will say that if you wanted to, don't quote me on this, but when I was a student at UNC working in their reference department, 
people could come in physically and use the databases there. Like if you were using one of their computers, they were sometimes able to do a guest login and you could access their information on campus. That may be the case with their law library. I do not know for sure. Okay, but otherwise we can, so if we feel like we've hit a wall, we can just email you. Mm -hmm. And yeah, absolutely. And I may, you know, I may end up consulting with some of my colleagues over there. Um, but yes, if you if you feel like you're not getting what you need or you can't find what you need, um, I can certainly do my best to help you find a workaround. Absolutely. We don't we don't tend to have, you know, Hine Online is one of our bigger um, legal databases. We don't tend to subscribe to things like Westlaw because we don't have a law school. But I'm happy to help you um, try and navigate that. There are there are some ways to get around some things. Other questions? Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the recording. Um,